the, the type of the fractures or injuries that we're going to talk today is olecranon, radial head, neck, terrible triad, transolecranon, and posterior montagia. So it's a spectrum of injury. It can go from simple to the complex, as you can see on these images. So sometimes it's very simple. Sometimes it's hard to read them. My objective is that hopefully you will be able to understand the anatomy of the elbow a little bit appreciate the unique patterns of elbow injuries and treatment goals in these injuries and hopefully to be able to describe how we're going to approach these injuries what are the goals of treatments on this kind of a bunch of elbow injuries that i mentioned can one of you guys speak up okay nobody's speaking up i'm going to call stable on you. stable elbow Okay, good. To achieve a stable elbow, well, and you what else we want to do? You want to give the patient a like the elbow in a splint or cast. It looks stable. X-rays looks everything located. Do you want to provide a functional range of motion so that the patient can function in their daily activities? Yes. Is so I put the patient in a cast. Is this good? The elbow will get really stiff. Yeah, you can't keep it too long, right? So to summarize what you guys said, to be able to achieve a stable elbow and to be able to start a range of motion that doesn't get stiff, you can keep it in a splint or a cast with some kind of immobilization, but not too long. So again, uh, to summarize, the goal is always to return to the prior functional level if possible with any injuries, any traumatic injury that we treat. The best way, especially the elbow is more predisposed to develop stiffness than any other joint in the body. So you have to start early unrestricted range of motion if possible, but some kind of early range of motion uh, after seven to 10 days maximum any kind of elbow injuries. And to be able to do that, you need to achieve a stable joint that Will mentioned. So, and to be able to have a stable joint, you need to restore the bony anatomy with some kind of fixation or replacement, but also you need to restore the ligamentous stability. That makes it elbow a little more complicated than some other joints. Elbow joint is made of three joints actually. So you need to, take into account that there's a joint between radius and ulna at the level of the uh, elbow, and this kind of is important for the forearm function. So there are medial ligaments, right? These are important ligaments on both sides of the elbow. So the anterior bundle is most important part of the medial ligaments, and the lateral ligaments, which is more commonly injured in most of the injuries that involves the ligaments, around the elbow. So lateral ligaments, the LUCL, more specifically, is probably the most commonly injured ligament around the elbow when any ligament is involved. And again, I put this two slides and there's nothing mentioning obviously about the capsule too much. So a capsule doesn't necessarily have too much of kind of input when these ligaments are intact. Okay. Another question, so what are the stabilizers of the elbow joint? So can somebody systemically can go through like, can you break it down? What are the major stabilizers of the elbow joint? Um, so you have the uh, major stabilizers, you have the ulnohumeral articulation, you have the MCL and the LUCL. Okay, so I'm gonna try to make it a little more simple so there, there's there are static and dynamic stabilizers maybe some of you guys heard about it or read about it so we're going to break it down in the dynamic stabilizers and static stabilizers we're going to start with the static stabilizers as Sarah, you mentioned so the first one is the static stabilizers are the bony ones right on the humeral articulation you mentioned and that on the humeral articulation seems to be there's a little small piece of bone, which is probably second to the odontoid as the size wise and importance wise in the body. The coronoid is part of this on humeral joint, but the whole on humeral joint is bony anatomy basically. And also the radial head itself 
are part of the static stabilizers, correct? So these are the static part of the static stabilizer. The other static stabilizers, which is not a dynamic function, are the ligaments, as you mentioned, the medial and lateral collateral ligaments. What could be the dynamic stabilizers then? Can somebody tell me what could be the dynamic stabilizer of elbow joint? Muscles crossing the joint, so it includes like triceps, the flexor pr pronator mass, as well as the extensors. Correct, and I will add to that the, also the flexors like brachialis, right? Uh, the muscles, basically triceps and brachialis, specifically flexing and extending around the elbow. Obviously, the common extensor or, uh, muscle uh, origin and all the muscles and common flexors. So. I'm gonna repeat this again. So stabilizers of the elbow joint, we break it down in the static and dynamic. Static ones in two groups, bony and ligaments, and dynamic are the muscles, okay? All right, so when I think about the elbow, thinking about all the stabilizers we talked about, I start thinking of all the structures because it's very important that you should be able to kind of assess and evaluate if any of this is injured or not, it's super critical. You can see MCL, LUCL. I put coronoid even in a separate bubble because it's an important piece of bone. Olecranon and proximal ulna, depending on the injury pattern, is a bony part and radial head and uh, valgus stress. And intraosteous membrane. So can somebody tell me why I put this interosseous membrane in this slide? What would be any kind of importance of the interosseous membrane in an elbow injury? Somebody comes in with an elbow injury and what the hell I'm thinking about the interosseous membrane of the forearm? You could have like an Essex Lepresti injury. So you could have an injury at the elbow and you could actually have, you know, instability of the forearm. And yes. All the way down to the district, uh, DRJ. Yeah, this is super important. So, uh, Charlie, what you would do, let's say you have a patient you're seeing in, in the ER or clinic, a radio health injury, what clinically you need to do? What do you need to check? Uh, pronation, supination. Um, I want full length forearm films and then pronation, supination and check the DRUJ. What do you ask the patient? Uh, well, I'd ask them to pronate and supinate and see how they, how they do. Usually these are kind of limited by pain, right? If somebody had a radial head fracture, acute radial head fracture, their pronation, supination may be limited depending on their pain tolerance. You need to ask them about their wrist, right? Do they have any wrist pain or not? And you need to kind of palpate the wrist. And as you mentioned, you need to check the DRUJ too. It's commonly not necessarily a DRUJ dislocation. Usually interosseous membrane and DRUJ injury, mostly in, axi in the longitudinal plane. So it doesn't necessarily on the X-ray actually commonly does not show up the SX low press the injury because it's an axial problem, right? The radius, the whole radius, radial bone is migrating more proximal relative to the ulna, okay? So keep in mind, any radial head fracture, think about SX low press the, it's not super common, but you need to check every time the rest. And you may wanna get the X-rays depending on the clinical uh, findings. Okay, let's talk about a little bit of olecranon fractures, okay? Olecranon fractures are similar to similar to the both bone forearm fractures for adults. Any displaced olecranon fracture in adults in general, I would say that they are all surgical because you will lose your extensor mechanism and they, they are prone to develop some soft tissue problems. So they are all surgical as default. And we will come to do then we may not uh, indicate the surgery at, at some times. So I'm gonna go with a kind of a case here. Let's say, let's pick up a junior. Hey, Dr. Canamere, can I ask a quick question? Wasn't there like a, a paper a few years ago that like looked at electron fractures in older patients? 
Yeah, I will mention that at the end of, I think, Alec, uh, yes, there's a paper from Edinburgh, Edinburgh, if I pronounce it correctly, Scotland, that mentions about that. So before you brought it up, maybe we should talk it now. So I think my default is still uh, surgical, unless a patient is not taking care of themselves, they are institutionalized, like somebody feeding them, etc. They do well. That study kind of looked at an elderly people, but I think you gotta be careful when you say elderly, there's not all elderly people. Let's say somebody who's using a walker for main mobilization purposes. I think that patient may require an olecranon fix because if you are leaning and you need your triceps and extensor mechanism to mobilize, you cannot say that, oh, this patient is elderly, household emulator, don't get out of the house even, and don't fix it. I think you gotta be careful when you use that indication most of the time. It's obvious that totally demented and they don't know where they are and they, they, that's totally fine. So not every patient, but very elderly institutionalized patients, I think he indicated that you don't need to do surgery because their flexors are there, their biceps is functioning, so they can eat, they can wash their face, they can do a lot of things. Mainly leaning on the arm would be a main limitations depending on what they do. Okay, so do we have any of the interns? Present. Let's see. Sergio's here. Sergio. <laughs> okay, I have this patient, 61 year old. They called from ED, fell off the truck at work. They called from ED. They say, like, this patient has a distal humerus, something, elbow. There's a, some wound around the elbow, too. Here are the x rays. What do you want to do? Distal in our, there's no trick. There's distal and neurovascularly intact. Yeah, I would first check if it's in any sign of an open fracture. They already um, told me that it's an open, there's a, some open wound, like two, three centimeter open wound on the, around the elbow. Okay, well, if there's concern for open fracture, I'd start have them start antibiotics while I make my way down there. Um, I want to get better x-rays, just dedicated films of the elbow, because right now I can't really see um, the elbow joint, so I want like a okay. AP oblique and lateral of the elbow. Okay, thank you. We don't have to go too fast. So that's a perfect point. You should never accept an inappropriate or inadequate x-rays to assess an injury. So we sometimes do this and you get in trouble commonly. So you want to see a good x-rays of the injury to be able to understand. So here are the x-rays. So what do you want to do? Uh, so there's a lateral and AP of the left elbow that shows, um, looks like a comminuted and displaced uh, electronon fracture. Um, Thank you. Thank you. That's good enough. Good, good. We don't have to continue. Uh, is there anything you see? Let me go jump onto the some senior resident here. Uh, Sachin, are you around? No. Monica? Uh, so looking at the lateral, there is a fracture fragment that's anterior to the elbow joint, and I'm not entirely sure where that's coming from. Because um, if it was just an isolated olecranon fracture, I wouldn't necessarily expect to see a fracture a piece that anterior. What's um, your best guess? Um, about where it comes from? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's gonna be a guess at this point. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I mean, it could be from the radial head or it could be from the, the anterior distal humerus, but it, my guess would probably be radial head, just given its location. Okay, so you mentioned radial head or distal humerus, which, okay. What else it could be? Um, it could be a piece of the cor coronoid as well. Yeah, I think I will put the coronoid in the list before the distal humerus. Okay. You see anything on a lateral elbow, any kind of chips of bones on the anterior part of like, I would say, 90% of the time, either it's from radial head or the part of the coronoid or proximal ulna. And sometimes it can come from the distal humerus, but they are usually either shear fractures or epicondyle fractures, which usually doesn't displace that much on the anterior leg. Okay, you see anything else like you wanna add on the AP, anything concerning? So you, you agree what Sergio said so far? Um. Yeah, I mean, it looks like a 
com like a comminuted displaced electron fracture um, on so you're saying on the AP that I'm being I'm concerned about or on the lateral I don't anything you want to add nothing tricky so um, yeah I don't think there's anything else I would add okay. at this point so I, I want to I put this x-rays of this patient for one reason so when we say electron on fractures and I think we need to we learned in the last decade that not all electron on fracture that we used to call are the same. So we are trying to separate a little bit of the typical electron on fractures and the proximal ulna metaphysial fractures somewhere in, in there, right? Normally on an AP view of the elbow is a typical electron on fracture, which is in the middle of the joint. On the AP, you don't see much of the fracture lines, right? It overlaps on the elbow joint level and the distal humerus. So I think when you call this, you should also call that olacronon slash proximal ulna fracture or olacronon fracture, which extends to the proximal ulna metaphysis. It goes even beyond the PRUJ, right? Distal, distal to the PRUJ. So I think it's really important to be able to understand and how you're going to manage these fractures. It's a very typical electron fracture or so as Charlie mentioned earlier they thought somehow this patient is not to, it wasn't mine to begin with but they got these x-rays and they got these x-rays Is he frozen for anyone else? Frozen for me. Can you see my screen now? Um, yes. Okay. Sorry, guys. So somehow the connection disappeared. Okay. So what do you look at on this X-rays, Monica? Um. So I would look for any fracture, distal, and then I also just want to look at the DREJ specifically. Okay, what, what exactly, the, in the SX Loprestia, I was mentioning earlier, you usually don't see a DRUJ dislocation necessarily in an SX Loprestia. If there's a real SX Loprestia injury, what is the worry that might happen and what this x-ray will show? Um, I think, I mean, the, I would, look for any associated fracture distally. I think specifically like an ulnar radial styloid fracture that might show that the energy traveled down the inner osseous membrane and then exited somewhere at the level of the wrist um, or like any changes in the carpal bone alignment. Okay, so these are, these are good points, but I personally, what I look at it is the inner shortening of the radial, radial bone, any shortening of the radius. I think I will be more concerned if I see that the radius is shorter than ulna regarding this interosseous membrane and real SX loprestia injury. Uh, obviously, you need to look at if there's any TFCC equivalent injuries, et cetera, and you need to check if there's a dislocation too. Okay. Sorry. Dr. Hey, Kandemir, Dr. Kandemir do you get equivalent you get... contralateral? Yeah, yes. I was gonna ask that question. Yes, so I think I will go with an X-ray. So I will check the clinical exam, right? If anything questionable, I will get an X-ray for sure. And if you are really cannot say, because there's a variation of the distal radius length, right? Uh, everybody's a little different. You need to check contralateral side. But the pitfall is that you need to put the forearm and the rest in the same position, right? If you put pronation in one side and supination on the other side, you're gonna have different relationship between the lengths wise between radius and ulna. So you gotta be careful what you are comparing to. They need to be, you need to be comparing apples to apples, uh, right to left, but the, the x-ray should be in the same position. The difficulty obviously when you have a radial 
uh, head fracture, sometimes it's hard to position perfectly uh, where you would position the arm for uh, the arm, but you should try for your best and the x-rays should be similar before calling uh, an SX to oppress the injury. Short of clinical symptoms. If there are clinical symptoms like forearm is tight or painful and there's a wrist pain or with any DRUJ motion palpation, there's any wrist pain, I think you should assume that there's an SX to oppress the injury and treat it up, uh, that way. Okay, so let's see, who's in senior there? Musa, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, looks like this patient got this intraop imaging uh, treated by the surgeon. What do you think? Uh, so wait, is this like, this is an intraop image of something or did he have something fixed and then he fell? No, this is the same patient that I showed in previous images. So it's been fixed. So yeah, these are so intraop images. I like it because there's some extra mini plate size plate too. Yeah, so uh, looking at the AP, I mean, you know, uh, it's kind of tough to make everything out because there's a bunch of hardware on top there. Um, things that you can typically look at is you can look at the congruency of the ulno humeral joint of the radial humeral joint as well to see whether or not you have any sort of shortening or if you have gapping there. Um, and then trying to look at the lateral here, it's not a very well shot lateral. Um, it looks like there's a lateral of the humerus, but I don't really see a lateral of the ulnar humeral joint, which makes me concerned for the quality of the reduction there. So you are con concerned about which joint? About the, uh, about, well, I mean also of the radiohumeral joint as well, because the radial head looks like it's subluxed on that poorly shot lateral. And then the ulnar humeral joint does not look congruent. Okay. Fair enough. I mean, it was a difficult fracture. So given, given the that of, uh, benefit of that for the surgeon, I think everything reasonably okay. As you say, it's not a perfect shot. The radius does, is not pointing towards the center of the capitellum. This is a little concerning, but the joint, ulnohemoral joint on the ulna side, it's hard to follow the subcortical lines, but uh, that's what, what the surgeon think? was able to do. I mean, do you think he looks a little on the AP? It looks not quite congruent. It looks a little bit gapped. You know, if you look at the congruency relative to the ulnar humeral joint. Ulnar humeral joint on the AP looks fine. A little more right, distance I'm, on the radio capitular area, correct. but maybe interrupt when the capsule is open. I don't think there's a huge problem on that AP. I can see. Yes, a little gap. I can see air arthrogram, but. It's not unusual with an open joint. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna just proceed. So these are the post-op x-rays for you, Musa. So, yeah, so once again, uh, on the lateral, I'm concerned that the radio capitellar joint is not lined, the radial head is not quite pointing up. Uh, once again, it's also not a well-shot lateral, so you can't definitively say that, but I mean, technically it should point more or less to the center. I don't know, the distal humerus kind of is an oblique view. I think it's pointing there. I'm the surgeon now, I'm gonna defend myself. So it doesn't look I mean, bad to me. Like I think because it's, it's oblique, I think it's still pointing there. Yeah, it should still point towards the center though. But the capitalum, it's hard to know which side is the capitalum, right? All these round things. It may yeah. be towards the capitalum or if you, think about the other round circle, it may be a little posterior. Okay, fair enough, let's move. Eight days post-op. Let's move yeah. to somebody else. Stop, Musa. Let's go to Eric. McDonald, are you there? I am here. Okay, so eight days post-op. I don't know why they get an X-ray in eight days post-op, but when the staple's on and you get another X-ray within a week, maybe you are, you are concerned, right? That's why you get another x-ray within a week. It's not kind of the default we do. Okay, what's your, what's your assessment? Um, to me, it looks like the ulna is a bit extended through, that, through that, the fracture there. Again, not the best 
um, lateral. Um, I agree that in this view, the radial head definitely looks subluxed to me. It's not a, I can't assess how well the ulno humeral joint is based off of this lateral. Fair enough. So you need a better lateral view to be able to say anything for the radio capitalar joint. Anything else you want to point out? Let's see, Alex. Oh, sorry, I just walked back in. He just walked back in. The radio capitellar joint on the AP looks like it's subluxing out medial, and I think on the lateral, the there's bone falling off the olecranon. It looks like something that's kind of coming off. You know, it's sort of falling apart. Yeah, I think the most critical thing. You got a thing screw that's here. sticking out medial on the plate that's not in bone. Maybe that piece of bone just kind of pulled off there. Um, I think it's the reductions all falling apart and it's it's subluxing. It's trying to sublux medial. Is there a capitellar fracture? There is no capitellar fracture actually. Oh, it's a good point. It looks like a line, but there was not a cap displaced capitellar fracture at least. So I think the most critical thing in this view that you need to recognize, obviously you guys pointed out radio capitellar joint, but there's a part of the proximal ulna that's kind of floating somewhere, right? And that yeah. never got any fixation, actually. I don't think there's a loss of fixation, but there wasn't any anything pointing. This was never the fixed. Way. So the piece that has the coronoid piece itself together, it's not just the coronoid, but the big piece of proximal ulna never got any fixation. But And this is eight days post-op. Anyway, so these are other yeah. views the same day. I think shows a little better some other things. Actual radio capitellar joint might be okay, except what uh, Ryan mentioned. There may be some kind of translational coronal plane uh, deformity, like the whole forearm may be moving a little more medial relative to the distal humerus, but on the lateral looks okay. But you can obviously see the proximal ulna anterior part of the proximal ulna joint part it's kind of floating there. So never get fixed. Uh, although they fix from the side, certain things. Looks like there's an eight days post-op. Dr. Kendler? So, yep. Um, for the initial evaluation, given it looks like some of the things weren't fixed intraoperatively, would you have gotten a CT scan at the initial injury presentation? I think I personally prefer to get a CT, all these proximal ulna fractures because two reasons, to be able to identify the injury exactly. Secondly, for the surgical approach and surgical planning. It's not easy to decide what you're gonna do, medial, lateral, and how far you need to go, especially when you have a associated fragment with the coronoid pieces, that the approach to that piece is not as straightforward approach as a typical olecranon fracture. I get CT scans for all of them. Uh, to be able to make a better plan and to be able to understand better. So we did the revision on this case. I think the point that I'm not going to go into the what, how did we did the revision, but uh, you cannot just miss this anterior proximal ulna pieces and it's not going to end well, right? So the elbow is not going to be stable. You're not going to be able to start range of motion. The joint is not going to be congruent and everything kind of will be missing. So, Dr. Kandemir, can you go back to his very first intra-op x-ray? Yep. So I guess, okay. I just want to see. So, I mean, I guess you would have to have some longer screws there kind of to get yes. that piece in. I mean, in this view, to be fair, it looks reduced. It is yeah. where it's supposed to be, looks like it, both on AP and lateral, as far as I can say. But never, there was no attempt to capture that piece. I can think... I, can you go back? one fly do the injury x-ray one time? Okay, got it. On this injury views, it's hard to assess that, right? Because the elbow is not reduced. So the distal humerus and ulna, so the distal humerus is more anterior relative to the ulnar shaft. So it's hard to assess. On the AP, you can kind of get a hint of that piece. There's a proximal ulna piece somewhere, but on the lateral, it's hard to see that it looks relatively reduced yeah it's okay, easier retrospectively you. but intro up when you see this right everything looks reasonable but you should always look 
that anterior part of the coron that piece that has the coronoid on it. And you need to capture that if there is a separate piece. You cannot let it go. Although it may be reduced well, it will displace with time, 99% of the time. I think the main problem in this case, probably the surgeon didn't have a good kind of knowledge and understanding of the injury itself and the importance of this anterior piece. I think this was the most critical part about this case. Okay? And I just right, want to make you. sure that these are not olecranon, on typical standard olecranon on fractures. Anything that involves in the proximal ulna metaphysis is a different type of injury. Okay? Got it. So this was the revision. I think I'm going to see him next week at six weeks, or this Friday, actually, at six weeks follow-up. Okay. So the revision of this case are more complicated, so I'm not going to go there. So in Just real quick, fracture, why did you replace the radial head? So the radial head, when you do revision surgeries, all the radi most part of the radial head was okay. In some of these views, you can see that part of the radial head is missing, correct? Yeah. Like, hold on, I can I guess use this. On the oblique, you can see it there, yeah. And on the AP, like this one, on the lateral view, you can see part of the radial head is missing, anterior part of the yep. radial head, right? Okay, so in the revision cases, I have a very low threshold to make the radial head anatomic. I think when you have an instability in addition to the bony injury, some kind of ligamentous problem too, in a revision case, if you don't replace that radial head, the radial head tries to subluxate on that sheared area. Basically, the capitellum wants to shear onto the that missing part of the radial head, and this creates extra strain for the rest of the fixation you put it in. There was some scuffing of the cartilage too. I mean, this patient, I saw him, I think, in six weeks or so. Uh, the cartilage wasn't great. I have a very low threshold to replace. I think you're going to make sure that all the constraints or the stabilizers of the elbow are kind of as anatomic or replaced when you do these things. Otherwise, you will regret it. That was the reason. And going back to the typical olecranon fractures, they are, these are the deforming forces, as we mentioned earlier, right? Brachialis and triceps, and they both cause kind of compression and, uh, around the joint, but usually the triceps causes the displacement. Uh, all the olecranon fractures are commonly operative and non-operative can be applied in the law of demand as we talked about it. And if you want to treat anybody with olecranon fracture non-operative, as, uh, as far as they are not elderly, it should be less than two millimeter step off. I usually don't accept that neither, but, and the extensor mechanism needs to be intact, right? And you need to show that with flexion extension. You need to almost stress test it. You cannot rely on a static x-ray, which we rarely do it because most of the electron fractures are displaced, okay? On the x-rays, you need to look for where the fracture lines are, but specifically, you wanna look at where the marginal impaction is, if there's any, because this may change your type of fixation. And you also need to check the other joints, obviously, if there's any associated injuries. The surgical options are usually some kind of tension band. It can be applied with either tension band wire or screw or a plate. The plate is still as on the tension side of the fracture. You can call tension band plating. I'm not gonna talk about the excision and triceps advancement, which you can do it in more low demand patient and unreconstructable and unfixable olecranon fractures. So positioning wise, you can put the patient in whichever position you want. I would say that you should put the patient in lateral decubitus unless you hate yourself or there's any good reason not to put the patient on the lateral decubitus. It may be some lung injury or something else, but I'd rather wait a couple more days or a week than trying to do this case in a spine position where most of the Midwest and Mayo people try still to do it in spine position, but I think it's much less ergonomic and easy to do in a spine position, but it's doable. But again, I don't hate myself and I put all these patients on narrow decubitus.
Tension band is you know, something you need to know. Uh, it's probably gonna come up in your test, but you may not be able to see at all, except maybe an AO course or some of the resident courses. The idea is that the tensile force is converted to the compression during the loading. That's what you can apply a tension band, the same idea in the patella. This is different than the static tension band that we apply sometimes on the, like the tip of the medial malleolus with small fragments. So dynamic tension band means that some of the forces, the uh, compressive forces increases as you, uh, you load the joint. So what will be a prerequisite to the tension band wire fixation in an olecranon fracture? Let's see. Abby, are you there? Tiffany? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, Abby. Uh, what so kind of fracture pattern would that be specifically? I'm going to try to make it simple, my question. So what would be, be the prerequisite to the tension band? Why? Should be a transverse, non comminuted like a transverse fracture. Um, yes. You, you have to be able to apply a plate or your transverse, your fixation on the tension side and then uh, be, be able to compress the articular side. Yeah, so the key is that on the articular side, as you mentioned, the fraction needs to be simple pattern. And the key is that on the articular side, there should be no comminution or marginal impaction because otherwise, as you try to load the joint, that area of the joint will kind of uh, lose the reduction. So the prerequisite to be able to the tension band has to be a simple fracture pattern. Okay, has to be no combination as we mentioned, and you should apply a modified AO technique. So the difference between the red circle and green circle images is that the K wires pointing in line in the intermediary canal versus anteriorly. So unless you do aim anteriorly, the chances that the risk that you may lose your reduction is higher. So you should do the one with the green, but the K-wires shouldn't be too long and should be aiming towards the radius. Otherwise you may have a problem about AIN palsy or PRUJ impingement. You need to place your wire under the triceps. Uh, so in this picture, I don't think it's clear on the AO picture, but the wire should be passing under the tricep not to constrain the triceps. It's a very low cost to benefit but there's a risk of K-wire back out and failure of fixation. I think that we don't like this failure of fixation risk. That's why we commonly do plate fixation. Any community fracture requires a plate fixation because you cannot apply the tension band wiring. So you need kind of a more plating on the tension side and neutralization plating, as you can see here. I think the failure rate is much smaller. That's why very few people are doing any kind of tension bending anymore. Obviously the cost is an issue. It's much more expensive than K wires and 18 gauge wire. And everybody will feel this, right? So there's a risk that you may need to go back in a second surgery too. Post-op rehabilitation wise, I usually put a soft dressing unless there's a concern of soft tissues, but I think it's okay to put in a splint for seven to 10 days for soft tissue concern. And you need to put this in relatively an extended position. I start non-weight bearing and active and active assisted range of motion gently, depending on the bone quality and the fixation. We're gonna go a little bit on the radial head neck fractures. Okay. I'm not sure how much we're gonna go. So let's see, I'm almost 928. Let me mention a couple of things until Amir steps in. Uh, so this is a patient fall on an outstretched hand. This is again kind of a transitional pattern injury. As you can see, there's a radial head fracture. But in addition, there's this proximal ulna fracture too, olecranon slash proximal ulnar metaphysis fractures. But as you can see, against the capitellum, there's no radial head. Radial head is somewhere not where it's supposed to be. It has been placed in this case. I'm gonna quickly move on this because I don't think we have time to discuss too much. So the goals on the radial head fracture is to restore the forearm range of motion because the radius rotates, right? Uh, forearm, elbow, and obviously the radio capital and PRUJ joints has to be stable. 
the thing that you need to know about the radial head, 240 degrees of the circumference articulates with the ulna. When you're gonna fix any radial head neck fracture, there's a safe zone. When you put the arm in neutral position with the thumb straight kind of up and the uh, Lister's tubercle sideways, there's about 90 degree laterally, there's a safe zone. So anywhere else, if you put any kind of fixation, it will kind of impinge in the PRUJ. There are, there are classifications about radial head and neck fractures. So the indications wise, I'm just gonna go quickly because we don't have too much time. The main indications are if there's a mechanical block and you, for this, sometimes it's hard to assess in the ED, you may need to do some lidocaine injection or assess the patient on follow-up in a week or so. If there's a, a basically a significant block, not that limited by pain necessarily, this may be an indication. Obviously, if the elbow is unstable, either radio capitular joint or the elbow somehow is unstable, or if there's an incarcerated intraarticular fragments, this will be the kind of the main indications. Excision alon should be done super rarely. To tell the truth, you should probably not see any excision. Should be done usually not acutely at all, maybe in some symptomatic elderly patients. And the, the prerequisite would be that the elbow has to be super stable after you remove it. You gotta make sure that there's no SX low presti injury or there's no other MCL or LUCL injury of the elbow to be able to do an excision. Otherwise you will have some problems. But even everything is stable and in that case, I think in a younger patient, still not the greatest idea because with time, the radius may migrate proximally and you may have risk problems in the long run after a decade or so. So it's 9.32. I don't know if Emir is gonna jump in or do I? Emir, are you there? I assume we are using the same link, but unless he's there, I can keep going until I finish. I don't see him yet, Dr. Kandem. Okay. I'm going to keep going until he texts or if anybody hears from him, then I can stop. Okay. So open reduction in turn fixation versus arthroplasty. So let's see, Nick. Or Gopal, are you there? I'm here. Okay. How we decide fixing a radial head versus replacement? So I think, uh, I mean, as you have here, so there is um, the number of fragments um, and the combination. So uh, in a type two, uh, um, simple uh, uh, one, one or two fragments, you can consider fixation, and then there are three or three or more fragments you can. Uh, or greater than three fragments, you would consider uh, radial head replacement. Um, so that would be my first instinct. There's also coronal shear in injuries to cartilage, so that if you think the cartilage is injured, then you would favor radial head replacement. Okay, if I have three fragments, each two millimeters, is that an indication to replace it? I think like the amount of the surface involved does matter, or like whatever the yeah. remaining intact part of the radial head, does it matter? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that it's, uh, if you think it's fixable, uh, is the most important. So if you think the piece, if, if, if the number of pieces are too small to be fixed, then, then obviously you can't. However, if they're two small pieces that, uh, so I think these are two millimeters that are like on the periphery, uh, then if the, if the elbow up here is stable after that, then, then you could consider taking them out. Okay. Yeah, I mean, good points. Obviously, the other thing that I want to underline is that, that you don't see as many radial head fixations is that once you fix it, you should also be able to mobilize the forearm, right? Otherwise it defeats the purpose. The elbow is gonna, or forearm is gonna get stiff or you're gonna have issues. The fixations should be stable enough that you can start early range of motion. Within seven to 10 days, you should be able to start the prosupination. And commonly this is not, easy to achieve. That's why a lot of times we err towards the replacement when there are multiple fragments, especially, because the more fragments, bigger size fragments there are, to be able to fix them, you need to apply fixation number one in an area which may not be the safe zone. Number two, 
even you fix them, especially the more comminuted neck fractures, is not stable enough to start range of motion. So for that reason, if you cannot do that, you better replace it because if you're not gonna move the patient in seven to 10 days at most, it's better to replace them. And most of the bigger fracture or multiple fractures or comminuted fracture will end up usually with radial head replacement. Again, so I'm, let me ask somebody, let's see if everybody was listening. But I'm Marcus, are you there? Steven? Yeah, I'm here. Steven, mm -hmm. why we keep replacing these radial heads in these young patients? Why not to excise? Uh, why not excise? Because you have limited function if you excise. Why? I actually, you get even better, quicker function, quicker, better function because there's nothing in there. But, the limit, uh, yeah. Yeah, but you get quicker re uh, degeneration of the associated other two joints of the elbow. Quicker degeneration of which joints the, is going to get degeneration? I, mean, I think you increase your contact stress through the, the um, ulnar humeral joint now that you don't have the, the lateral call. I mean, you're essentially missing like the lateral call in there. Yeah, this is, a, this is a good point, but it doesn't get degeneration that quickly, actually. To tell the truth, if you do radial head excisions, uh, actually there's a study from Northern Europe with I think 18 to 20 year follow up with radial head excisions, then they are all doing pretty well, like uh, up to two decades good results. I think the way you think you, you thought about it is correct, hmm. but that degeneration doesn't happen too quickly. Why we wouldn't? I wouldn't. You wouldn't see me excising a radial head commonly. Like Maybe. why we don't do excisions more common than not? We, why we try to fix it or replace it uh, instead of excising them? I think I tried to mention a little earlier. That's what I'm asking again. Anybody wanna? So let's see. I mean, well, you talked about like form instability. I'm not sure if that's what you're getting at. This is part of it. In the long term, this may be an issue too. But in the short term, in the acutely. Like let's say if there's any problem that I'm worried about or most of the Surgeons are worried about not to excise, but replace, uh, fix or replace. Loss of range of motion, maybe? No, the range of motion would be much better mm. with excision than any. I'm it contributes to elbow stability. So I think the biggest problem is, so I, maybe I'm asking like what you, I'm thinking, but that's the reason I'm trying to get you the message that the reason we don't do excisions and we try to either fix it or replace is very hard to know if there's any associated ligamentous injuries when you are treating a radial head neck fracture. Let's say you miss an associated ligamentous injury and here I'm meaning LUCL and MCL, okay? If you miss any of these injuries, that elbow is gonna deteriorate and have problems earlier with subluxation and dislocations quickly. Not in a decade or two, like in a uh, interosseous membrane like problems or the longitudinal axial problems. That's why it's very hard to judge the MCL, for example, right? When you don't have that radial head in place, it's hard to judge if the MCL is injured or not because you need a spacer there. Maybe another way to do it, you just use trials, put the radial head in there, test it that MCL is perfect, and you can possibly check the LUCL while you are in there visually and also checking on the flora. And if you confirm that in throughout the range of motion, then in that case, you may excise it. Otherwise, you don't wanna miss one of the subtle or not obvious ligamentous injuries. That's why most of the surgeons will go to the route that fix it or replace it because otherwise you may have a significant problem of the elbow, okay? Dr. Kandemir, just to, to clarify, so are you saying that if you fix or replace the radial head, but there is also a missed ligamentous injury because the radial head is a stabilizer of the elbow, that it makes up for the fact that there is still a ligamentous injury? Because you're not actually fixing that ligamentous injury, you're just providing an extra stabilizer? Correct. You still need to look at the ligamentous problems, but think of that way. Let's say you have a grade two MCL injury, okay? 
and you have a radial head in there versus you don't have a radial head in there. That type two, the grade two MCL injury it will be much more problematic and there's a high risk of subluxation and dislocation when you don't have that radial head in there versus where you excise the radial head. That's the reason that we don't want to take that risk. That makes sense. Dr. Okay. Kander, can you, can you go over your thought process for um, when you would just do an excision then? Is it size of the articular surface that's intact or do you do like an EUA uh, before, before deciding to do that? So let's clarify the excision. So I'm not talking about just removing small pieces of kibbles, right? I'm talking about the complete radial head excision. This should be super, super rare and I probably won't do it, okay? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Because the thought process is here, this. So the excision, why you would do an excision? The prerequisite for an excision, you need to confirm that the elbow is stable to be able to do an excision. Basically, once you excise it, you're gonna make sure that MCL, LUCL is completely intact. Otherwise, you should not excise the radial head because it will cause more instability, correct? And if I'm gonna do just an excision, this will be a very rare patient and has to be symptomatic, right? And it's not gonna be an acute patient. If it's for an acute radial head neck fracture, if I'm going and if I'm gonna do a surgery for the patient, either the fragments are displaced enough, is it a mechanical block? There's something other than just the radial head non-displaced fractures. A displaced radial head neck fracture greater than two, three fragments that I'm gonna either try to fix it or replace it. I don't wanna take the risk of just excising and having a, this, some of the subtle ligamentous problems causing an issue. In younger patients, in addition to that, in a decade or two, they're gonna have wrist problems because this radius potential will migrate proximally and will cause uh, ulnar abutment syndrome at the wrist. So the excision is, usually not a safe way to go. Hopefully that's more clear. Thank you. Okay. So we use kind of the, I call this as a spacer because for the valgus, uh, valgus stability, right? When you have that radial column, the radial head replaced or fixed, you will have the constraint against the valgus instability. So it's kind of, you need to have something in there, either natural head fixed or replaced. And you don't want to overstuff the joint. Is Nick there or any R4s? Nick? Nick is not there. Okay, let's go. Michael Davies. I think he's enjoying his award, Young Investigator Award. Heather. Well, did we lose the most people? We can hear you, Utku, don't worry. Oh, I'm okay. here, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, uh, yes. Amir is here, so I'm gonna finish it up. So what do we mean by overstuffing the joint when we replace the radial head? Um, so it basically means that you put in too large of a, of a radial head implant. And I think that the way that you assess that is by looking at the ulnohumeral joints. Um, so you, you say make too sure. large, in which dimension? Uh, Length-wise, I guess, like uh, you're opening, you're basically opening the joint too much. Yeah, you, you, you are mentioning correctly. So I just wanna make sure that it's clear. So. Most overstuffing problems that we are worried is the lengthwise, the heightwise of this radial head replacement. And if it, to put something too big, the radial side of the ulnohumeral joint will open up relative to the uh, medial side of the ulnohumeral joint. You can also overstuff the joint on the diameter of the radial head wise too, which is a less of a problem, but usually we err when you are in between sizes, which is 90% of the time, we should err on the smaller side because the joint usually gets a little more stiff due to the inflammation, okay? But most common problem is usually the lengthwise, okay? Thank you.